Thank you very much. So I'm Stefan. This is Hendrik. Uh, welcome to our talk. And um, yeah, it's our first time at EuroPython, and we really, really like the conference. And we are also very new to Python, and we would like to share some of our experiences or projects. So we will talk about an implementation project and how we will achieve our visions. Um, one thing is very important. Um, we are talking here about old school data management. So uh, we don't think old school is bad because if we remember the party yesterday, um, and if you think about when did the party started, it started when the DJ started to play old school hip hop songs. So we really like old school, but we also would like to share some of our new ideas with you. Um, some words about us. So we both wanted to join the community, and that's why we are here both. And um, I'm more a little bit responsible for products. Um, Hendrik is um, our Python guy, our data analyst. And um, yeah, he is doing some uh, research in Karlsruhe at the KIT. Um, he's doing his master there. And he has a lot of experience in machine learning, neutral nets, cognitive systems. Uh, and he's doing a lot of research uh, on event detection in big data streams. Um, we are working for Sobis, just some small words about our company. So we are a small company from Germany. Um, um, our core business are at the moment web applications, uh, collaboration systems and mobile solutions. And uh, yeah, within the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes, we would like to share our journey, how we discovered Python, why we are using Python, and I will start a little bit with our vision because we will talk about one of our products at the beginning that exists for 20 years. And with Python, we are able to implement these visions. And then Hendrik will show you how we do this and how we use Python to cluster communication and detect events. And another reason why we are here is we are the new guys, so everything is new and we like it. Um, if you have any feedback uh, for us, it would be a pleasure if you talk to us later because uh, we can learn a lot. Um, I would like to start, and this is the only, let's say, sales slide, um, to tell you a little bit about our project, um, or our solution. So we are taking care about collaboration and communication in large projects. And the idea is that in this solution, uh, the industry is taking care of correspondence, documents, everything you need in these uh, big projects, and they are sharing this information. This project exists for 20 years now, or this product exists for 20 years now, and it all started with Lotus Notes Domain. Does anyone know this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, today, not a lot of companies are using Lotus Notes anymore, but 20 years ago, we started with this product uh, using Lotus Notes. Uh, let's say eight years ago, we switched to Java web applications, and I've learned a lot this week, so we all love Python, but Java is a little bit strange. So, but in 2009, we decided, okay, we have to go to a new technology um, because all of our customers left Lotus Notes. So we had to make this decision. And this was also the time when we decided, okay, we have to implement some uh, agile, agile development methodologies, etc. cetera. Um, and two years ago, we finally discovered Python because uh, Python helped us really to implement our visions in our products. And before we start into this vision, what we had at that time, um, maybe a little bit more about the challenges that we have. Um, in the industry, <clears throat> for example, our customers are building these kind of big plants. And in these projects, they're taking two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. We have a lot of communication and a lot of complexity. That means we have a lot of information that we have to take care of and we have a lot of data that we have to take care of. And this is getting even worse when we have a look at how many people are working in these big projects. So we have different disciplines. We have external persons who are working in this project, engineers, commercial guys, sales guys, uh, project management teams from different suppliers, consultants, etc. So a lot of people are working together. And when we have a look at communication in this project, it's really, it's a mess. We have thousands of mails, we have today, we have messengers, we have a lot of different systems where these information are stored. And it's really, really a big challenge for the industry to take care of this information. And this is even getting worse 
when we're talking about portfolios. So uh, the big players in the industry, they are taking care about thousands of projects at the same time. And um, we have to find a way to manage this kind of communication and information. And there are a lot of solutions out there. We're trying to solve this problem. And what are we doing? Not just us, but everybody in the industry. We are trying to manage our project communication. So, I mean, in the IT departments, we are using Slack or Jira today. But uh, in this kind of projects, people are still used to manage communication and data in folder. We have a folder structure. We will organize this information. We have tools uh, like uh, correspondence, metadata. We have a controlling possibilities. We have all this kind of manual work. So you can define favorites, tags, reports, filters and full text search, etc. I think you know that from all of your solutions or from different kind of solution. The challenge that we have here, it's everything is manually. So you have to classify everything manually, you have to organize your data manually in these kind of systems. And this is something what we call, this is our search content. So if users who are using this kind of systems want to search for a specific content or information, it's always like, yeah, I know the topic, I know that there's something in there, and I'm going into these kind of systems, and I want to find that. So we are doing that the same way in, in our solutions that we provide for the industry. So everything is this kind of search content where you have to look for this information. Um, but we had the vision. <clears throat> so, I mean, we all know Facebook and these cool technologies. So is this kind of manual classification of information still state of the art today? So do we manually have to classify information? Do we manually have to classify correspondence? Um, this was one question that we asked ourselves. And the other question was, um, we can manage this data, but we always manage this data by, let's say, tags. Who sends it? Who created a document? But we never use the core, the information that is in the document or correspondence itself. And our vision was always for the last years, uh, can't we change the way how these people work to give them a support, to provide some content and information for our users? So, our question was, how can we implement the possibility that our application provides content? Can't we present this kind of content to this specific audience? And um, we always asked us, but we never found an answer to these questions, and we never had the technologies to do these kind of things. So what we did, yeah, we talked to our customers, like all the other companies, too. And um, when we did that, uh, we got a lot of information back and we summarized this kind of information. So we developed our vision. Um, the challenge was our vision, we could not implement that with our existing tools like Java and all these things. And um, just to summarize, our vision is <clears throat> we wanted to implement these cool features like recommendation engines here. Yeah? Can't we dr uh, drill down the information to the information that a user needs at a specific time? Can't we use these kind of project correspondence and communication data to identify domain experts in a project? Yeah, in, a, in this uh, big, if you're working in a big company and we have all this information available, can't we profile users? Can't we tell our, our <clears throat> uh, community in a company, okay, we have these kind of experts, can't we automatically detect this? Um, can't we identify trends and risks in projects? So if a, if a project manager is opening our, the program in the morning and, and the application tells him, yeah, welcome back to your project. Something important happened. And please have a look at that. And we also said, okay, can't we implement things like clustering and event detection? So when we have a lot of correspondence, a lot of information, can't we implement an automated process how we bring this information together? And um, that's what we are going to show you now because um, now we will show you how we implemented uh, what we called machine learning as a service um, that allows us to identify topics and clusters in correspondence. And of course, we did that with Python, and that's why we're here. And Hendrik will show you now how we did that in detail. Thank you. A warm welcome from me, too. Um, I will show you how we um, solve some of the, the problems Stefan identified um, just now. 
and I will talk about the task of identifying topics, hot topics and events in uh, social stream data. As you can see, um, communication within projects, emails and correspondence is just a social stream. So what's topics after all? Topics are basically labeled clusters, and clusters are points in a space which belong together due to their similarity. So in the picture on the right side, you can identify three distinct clusters, the red one, the blue one, uh, the green one, and the blue one, and some outliers outside of the cluster. You can depict them as, as communications or emails or tweets, anything which is a communication basically. And if you uh, manage to put a label on it, you have basically, um, yeah, you have identified the topics basically. So maybe the, the green cluster is uh, concerned about Order 66, the, the red one is concerned about project management, and the blue one um, is concerned about invoices. So what's hot topics after all? Hot topics are basically communications um, that belong together which grow exceptional in a distinct period of time. Um, it's similar to a trend. The trend evolves over time. You could see the Europython as a trend if you uh, monitor the, the Twitter stream. It begins slightly before the Europython and will hold slightly till after the Europython as the message um, with the hashtag Europython will, um, will be more in this time period. In contrary, we identify events in, in uh, streaming data also as exceptional cluster growth but in a shorter time period or the building of a new cluster as there is a communication which is um, not similar to any other communication which has to be put into another cluster. Um, I won't speak about noise because this is another hard topic and I could fill more time with it. So what's the, the information after all which we have available to, to identify these? Basically, we know our participants, we know our content, and we have the, the uh, metadata which is manually, uh, manually um, put into our communication and ordered by our customers. So we can build a communication model. This is a social stream graph. People talk to other people, send uh, messages to each other, and those are maybe tagged with the, uh, the aforementioned metadata. So we compare messages and uh, text to each other, but we also um, identify groups of people belonging together as they are uh, highly communicative um, within this group. And outliers, of course, who talk only less with other people and so on. So what's this uh, graph built or each communication built of basically? This is an atomic model. We call it social stream object. Each communication is based on a sender, a content depicted by uh, the edges here in the graph, and a set of one or more receivers. Basically, it's a hypergraph as um, T1 depicts um, only one message which is sent to three people. If you compare it with, with big streams like Twitter, um, you would have a, a big audience, um, every Twitter user who is able to see your message, of course. So what do we do? Basically, the, the hardest topic within it all is cleaning and normalization of the data. Of course, you have much noise in, in any communication data. This is a machine learning problem. And uh, for example, to, um, to remove footer or reply lines from emails, or other communication and stop words. We utilize neuronal networks, um, explicitly um, a multi-layer perceptron to um, remove those lines uh, from automatically from email, which is trained on our uh, company data. Then we compare the, the textual similarity. We compare the structural similarity, who sends a uh, correspondence to whom, and the other similarities are the tags we have, uh, the metadata we have in, within our communication. The similarities en detail are basically relatively simple. They are the term frequency inverse document frequency based cosine similarity between the correspondences or the clusters. 
And we have also bit vectors, which depicts the, um, the sender receiver sets within a cluster and uh, the correspondence. And we normalize tag mutualities between um, the different correspondences. So the most algorithms um, suited for streaming data and um, email and company correspondence could be seen as very slow stream, uh, stream data. Um, expect one value. So we built a linear combination from the different similarities and generalized them on, on, uh, different, uh, on many similarity measures we can gather from the other um, things. Lambda here is um, harder to, to um, infer from uh, our system domain because um, it seems that the structure who sends whom an email is much more beneficial, uh, for example, for clustering than the actual content for clustering the information. So how do we do this? Um, as we evolved from a Java company, yeah, Java is not so good for data science. Um, you need just too much time to build boilerplate code. You can't experiment fast on, on some new data or algorithm. So, um, yeah, I would call it resting in this case. But, um, yeah, Python delivers awesome, awesome libraries which we utilize for just this course. So, we have uh, Jupyter and Pandas for quick experiments on data or trying to, uh, to implement some machine learning algorithms. We have Spacey, an awesome uh, fast natural language processing library which we utilize to um, do lemmatization. Does everybody know what lemmatization is? Okay. <laughs> Basically, we, we, um, uh, we try to get the word stems, the, the base words from each word to get a normalized representation of the word, um, which is really fast. Uh, we use Flask to expose our services to our other solutions, and we use Scikit-Learn to um, implement, for example, multi-layer perceptrons and um, uh, support vector machines to uh, identify noise in, in uh, correspondences. And uh, our, um, the results of our research is uh, stored in a MongoDB, which is a very good and very fast um, NoSQL database, but I guess everybody knows this. So what's our workflow? Um, it's slightly different. We came from a normal, normal iterative uh, incremental work, and now we have to do research as some of the solutions still or just don't exist. You have to, to experiment to get the solutions right. So basically, we begin with a Jupyter notebook, do some work, try some, something out, and from there we go to a design, an implementation, test of course, and a partial deploy of a um, business functionality, you could say. But uh, due to the, uh, our inexperience with Python between Jupyter and design, and between design and implementation, there uh, are often some hiccups, because um, you have to adapt to the, to the Python rules and can't just um, build, or it would be really ugly to build uh, Java solutions in Python. So the, the cycle is a little bit shorter, and you jump over, yeah, between implementation and Jupyter Notebook uh, more often than wished for. So how do we, ex um, how do we interface with our existing solutions? We build Java web applications with their own quietly sophisticated security measures, authorization features, authentication, and their own object relational mapper like Hibernate, for example, a quite modified Hibernate which makes things harder and a multitude of databases um, which our clients uh, want to be supported. So we have to, to expose our solution in other ways. And this would be basically, um, PSA stands for our peer system and R for analytics, would be uh, to expose and control API, to uh, revert control back to our other solutions, a resource API, which stands for uh, the findings our algorithms do, and uh, of course, a processing and a state management. 
These are basically the, the simple uh, parts of the application, and we call it simple MLAS, <laughs> Machine Learning as a Service. So which were, what, was, uh, what are the, the challenges we had? The challenges are basically security concerns. Um, we handle highly confidential material in case of uh, plant building or chemical sites. And um, yeah, how do we implement uh, the security um, or how do we guarantee that the security between our uh, former systems and uh, the new machine learning systems are held? Then um, the services therefore must be designed specifically and we have to adhere to some security standards within the, the industry. Um, interfacing was a problem because um, if we want to analyze data within a former database, then we have to yeah, access the database directly, which would break the security rules. So we, we decided to do a loosely coupled system, for, ex, uh, for example, on just read, don't write, of course. Then uh, we are relatively inexperienced um, to the scientific cycle, and uh, so process iterations within iterations may be not the best uh, thing we can do. And we have to, to gather more experience. Um, and the last concern is an ethical concern. Um, privacy. This, uh, this information we build can, of course, be misused to spy on, um, on workers, co-workers, how do they work, and so on. So it's a consumer problem. What do we want to expose, really, from the things um, we, we uh, find in, our, in, our, in the, the customer's data? So these both processes are not finished, and yeah, advice would be welcome. In this case, I want to thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Okay, we have almost eight minutes for questions, uh, yeah, and then a bit we have <laughs> break for the coffee break. So. Great on time, excellent. So any, any question? Yes. Uh, can you specifically, thank you, thank you very much for your talk and uh, for this tremendous transition from Java to Python. And uh, specifically I'm interested in what, speci what exact tool set from the Python uh, standard library or maybe something else. Um, you, you don't hear me, right? Um, uh, could you repeat the last part? Uh, I, I've understood Python standard library, but... Uh, basically, what was the key things in uh, your decision to, to switch to, to Python from Java? Um, the, the key thing why we didn't do Java or the, the main point was a search for natural language processing libraries. And um, we compared them, we have speed constraints. And uh, the fastest natural language processing library out there at the moment would be Spacey. And every millisecond added here or added here would uh, greatly slow down our, uh, our solution space, of course. And um, after researching a little bit of space in experimentation, the, um, yeah, the choosing wasn't hard because, of course, we need a, a multi, multifunctional language on the other part. So uh, data science tools like R, even if it sounds like a pirate language, which is cool, um, wouldn't come to mind. And Python has great capabilities for interfacing with, with other technologies, of course. So these were the, the basic reasons because, uh, why we choose Python. Any other question? Yes.
Do you share uh, some of your um, code open source uh, in some way, or um, GitHub or whatever? Um, basically, um, the, the sharing of the code, um, the similarity measures the tools, but not exactly the, the streaming code, unfortunately. <laughs> Because there are um, the reason behind this is not we we won't share uh, we don't want to share but there are uh, customer specific uh, meta tags included which would um, give hints on on processes in uh, within customers uh, by customer projects and this uh, can't, we can't just do this. Any other question? Yes. Um, there were some, some hiccups, of course, and uh, a little bit of bumpy road. Um, the thing is, um, the first things were, were not so hard. The experimentation with Jupyter and Python is a really, uh, is really a language which you can um, learn quite easily, but master quite hard. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I try to, uh, we try to, to get more experiences on this. Um, right now, my solution space seems a little Javanic, I guess, but uh, I have to forget some of the Java things and uh, throw them overboard in my mind <laughs> to, to get better, better systems. Yeah, um, I. If I can, I uh, won't go back, actually, <laughs> to Java. <laughs> okay, but I have to admit, we are still using Java for the product, so uh, we are not only Python now, so we are using both worlds. Any other question? We have uh, three more minutes for some questions. Uh, if not, I can ask a question myself. Um, very fascinating project and a great success story uh, since for Python, obviously. Um, yay, Python. Uh, can you give us an idea on the type of scale that you're working at? Like, I don't know, I imagine you have tons of email messages or, you know, chat messages come in. Um, if you can give a rough idea. Um, you want to know how many or yeah, how many messages you go through uh, your system? It's project specific, um, but we have, um, you can, um, our bigger projects have uh, 300,000 to 500,000 uh, communications, but this is not, the case, um, not only the case, there are documents involved also, which are quite large, and we search also the document space, which isn't mentioned here, because um, for the clustering process, you first don't need to, to inspect the documents. And this um, above many projects, but um, about the, the amount of projects, Stefan may be better able to answer. I, I would say uh, an average project you will have about six to 10,000 emails a month, so it's not really big data, but you have a lot of additional information that we evaluate, like actions or other messages. And uh, an average customer of us has about, let's say, 400 to 500 active projects. So. That's the, the average amount of data. Okay. Any other question? We have time for one question. Well, I can also ask the last question myself. Uh, well, uh, so you mentioned privacy issues, and uh, I could imagine uh, some people, especially workers in those companies, could be a little bit nervous, do you get, um, I don't know, any feedback or any resistance uh, from anybody or people are pretty happy, <coughs> they see the advantages? Yeah, it, it's, at the end it's a decision, decision of a customer or company if they're introducing this kind of systems. Um, but we got some feedback, uh, if you remember the slide when I said we talked to our customers. And um, during these kind of workshops, we had a lot of uh, controversial conversations. So you found every opinion. People who like Facebook, they also like this kind of systems, uh, for example. Uh, but you also found uh, engineers or project managers who say, no, nope, I don't want to have such a system because I still can think. Uh, but this kind of tool, it's just, uh, just a tool, 
that should support your daily work so um, it doesn't force you to do anything different than before. So you find every kind of opinion regarding these tools. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again.